everyone. My name is Dara and this is Dear Hallmark. And we are about to talk about some Hallmark movies and mystery stuff as we are continuing our journey into the world of Color My World with, or Color The World with Love. <laughs> and I have the distinct pleasure and honor of sitting with someone who is a photographer who's been on so many movie sets, more than McDonald's pumps out fries. So please welcome Alistair Foster, ladies and gentlemen. Alistair, thank you so much for being here. How are you? Oh, really good. It's, it's like, it's really wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. So let's kick it off with like a, a fun question. Um, what's a song, an album, or an artist that you kind of have on repeat right now? A repeat, oh, that's a good one. Uh, right now. Oh, you're gonna you caught me. <laughs> I mean, I'll 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 do my go-to, which is like usually when I'm introducing myself to everybody, I'll say, uh, "You can call me Al," like a good Paul Simon song. Oh, I won't okay. use it. I won't because it's a great. I Graceland is a great album. Uh, uh -huh. It's always always in the background. But uh, what am I listening to right now? Going through some. Bonobo right now which okay. is uh yeah so it's a there's a like we have an eclectic we'll get into that later but there's a this it's a very eclectic musical taste in our house so yeah, yeah. likewise yeah. I get into moods myself like sometimes I can be in a punk rock mood I'll be in a neo hey. soul mood I'll be in a Hamilton hey. mood I'm just kind of like all over the place <laughs> that's right so, sometimes you just need a little Leon Bridges in your life and sometimes you just you, you know, sometimes you just need to cry in the corner with some shade. I'm just come on. And sometimes yeah. I'm feeling paramour. So it's like I'm all over. Hey, <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. I, I went through I went through a tool phase myself. So it's it's all over the map. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So let's let's dive in a little bit to your history here. Um, you are a photographer. And I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but one of the things that captivated me when I read your biography on your website was the line where you said, you're serving the image and capturing with intention. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Just your, I guess your photography philosophy, if you will, yeah. it seems like that line is. I did say that, didn't I? Uh... <laughs> you said it, it's in writing. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, I did not pay anybody to say that for me. No, uh, I think for me, it uh, it kind of means that I think uh, as a photographer, you often think that you're working for your client, which you are, you always are. Um, mm -hmm. And that can kind of go. And then I think from an outside perspective, when people think about photography and photographers, they might think that it's like, it's wonderful because you get to do what you love to do as an artist and work in your medium and get paid for it but you don't always get to do it your way mm -hmm. so you know what i mean so yeah. like if you if you're always working for the client you don't always kind of get that uh satisfaction back but like there's a there's a big theme i think in our life in our house where it's like excellence in all things mm -hmm. which is like it's irrelevant of how like out external um grading you mm -hmm. know like it doesn't matter right like if you if you know that you did a great job and, yeah. and you and you feel that and you did it to the best of your abilities with the skill sets that you have then that's all you need to know right regardless of how your client feels so and usually when you do that and you're and i i kind of translate all that into photography as like instead of working for the client you're working for an image so you're just trying to make the best image that you can and as if that image is your box, right? Mm -hmm. And you look at a picture as a, as a photographer, at least I do, and I'll say, yes, I did a good job by this photo, right? Like this one image. And I really yeah. feel like I did it justice that moment uh, and being in the moment and being present is kind of like the second part of what I was trying to like, explain in one concise sentence is like just being really in that moment to be able to do that. And, and you feel good, right? Like you look at the image and you're like, I don't know if I probably could have done better. If the image was my boss, then I feel like my boss would be really happy. And then usually the client is also happy. And then you also kind of don't feel like you're like the scale of how you're judging yourself and your career isn't married to people's feelings, which are just like, they can be everywhere, right? Right, because art is yeah. so subjective. 
it that's really it. is. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's, that's such a beautiful way to look at it. I um studied interior design and I feel like that same philosophy could be um communicated in that field as well. It really is like um I think it's universal. Like again, it comes back to like if you're just doing your bet the like the absolute best and you're exhausting your your capacity in that moment, then what yeah. else could you possibly and it doesn't necessarily mean that like that is a hundred and forty percent all the time. It just means right. that, you know, you just you just try, just keep trying. That's all it is. It's just another way of saying you just gotta keep trying and try to aim for like high you don't always win because sure. life sure. right cut. But like, and then the idea of like service is really big in our house, right? So like really trying to encapsulate that instead of thinking that you're like, you're working for something, which usually means that you get something back. But if you're serving something, mm. there isn't anything that you expect to come back at you, right? Yeah, yeah. You're just, you're just ready to give. And if you are, if you set that tone, then it means that you're less likely to be exhausted, right? Because you don't feel like you're always just like giving, giving and waiting for something to come back. Right. service is just this is for you right? yeah just giving yeah. uninhibited and with no ulterior motives or intentions that's beautiful that's so beautiful hey, thank excuse you. me thank you um so let's bring it back a little bit uh talking about your upbringing you were born in the bahamas but grew up in canada correct for the uh Born in the Bahamas, yes, and then I would I moved to Southern Ontario to go to boarding school and high school at the, at the age of thirteen. Okay. So yeah, so all my formative years have been in Canada. So yeah, but uh, yeah, born thirteen years in the Bahamas. My mother's Canadian. My dad is past. He's Bahamian. So I have oh, like sorry. both. Both. Hey, it's just it is what it is. Yeah. Um. And uh, yeah, and so I had I had both of those kind of sides contributing to that and then coming up here was a way for me to kind of my mom really trying to open up a lot of opportunity for me so yeah if you can remember was there a big adjustment moving from the Bahamas to Ontario uh I mean yes but yes actually yeah there was I mean <laughs> there was <laughs> like I think part of it was masked in like you're 13 uh, like you know it's like the beginning of that time where you're just like I'm my own person I can but yeah I like I actually had access to like exercising that mm -hmm. by like essentially moving out of home right mm -hmm. when I was 13 so I I felt like I was ready and I was excited so I think that masked a lot of the um like the pain of change because mm -hmm. I was excited about it and it, it also helped that there was like, I went to, it was a like ridiculously small boarding school, um, but there was a lot of diversity there. And that really, that was like a big thing because it was, a, it's a small town in Ontario, yeah. not a lot of diversity in the town, but where I was and the people that I was immediately surrounded with were, um, didn't really, like they filled that gap pretty easily. So yeah, I was, I was really lucky that way. And a lot of support, like a lot of support. So, but yeah, it's, I mean, culturally, yes. Yeah, it yeah. Was, was a few changes. But like, uh, it was very cosmopolitan upbringing, I guess is one way to put it. Um, mm -hmm. Like, you know, definitely like more of a worldly uh, experience that I had when I was a kid. So it was mm -hmm. kind of like already ready to kind of be just beyond my national borders. So yeah, long <laughs> answer. But yeah, it was it was like, it was an adjustment, but I was ready. I was like, yeah. Long answers good. are welcome here. I call it the crock pot version. So bring on the crock pot. We, we welcome yeah. the crock pot here. Right um, on. Do you feel like that that worldly opening that you got, for lack of better words, um, contributed or informed in any aspect you moving into photography? Or can you expand on just how you moved into photography in high school? That's a really good question. Uh, yes, definitely. I think, I mean, as all things that you know, experiences, they make us who, you know, we're the sum of all those experiences. I'm sure it has something to do with it. Um, uh, like, mm, I grew up with a lot of creative people around me. So I always kind of thought that I would end up in some sort of arts. And mm. uh, like in grade school, I was, I did a lot of drawing and painting. Uh, okay. but I don't know if it ever really took. Yeah. I mean, it's, 
it's hard. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I don't know. High school was really where there was some photography when in my younger years, but it really wasn't like I didn't have that traditional like my parents, one parent or another or both had a camera that then you inherit and then you kind of fool around with. And then I didn't really have access to that. But in high school, mm. at the end, I it was a very arts like based kind of high school. Mm. We had to kind of pick a medium. And I like the technical aspect of photography. And I can't really remember what tipped me over, but I was already sort of like, taking pictures and documenting and really being like having fun with being out with friends and being the one who had the camera mm, and mm -hmm. not to date myself, but we <laughs> only had film. Then, yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. so that it was kind of like a little, it was a little bit more unaccessible in some ways, as much as it was like normal that you just kind of, you have everybody had point and shoots and you just shot film and you took it to there was a thousand labs and all that stuff but I it just kind of happened organically and the more that I got into it the more I sort of like you know, the the nerd part of me really got into like the the how the stuff works you know because yeah. even as a kid I was really, really into taking things apart and putting them back together and then uh so that part really kind of like satiated and then like it's also creative and subjective and it is like me a a wonderful artistic medium um but it is also like this wonderful recording device you know where you yeah. kind of get to find a moment but then you kind of keep it whereas like yeah. in a lot of other art forms it really is kind of more like you're creating out of thin air right mm -hmm. as much as you may paint something that is reality it still feels like you really created something photography yeah. kind of like is a little bit more re removed from that yeah. because it has to be a little bit more based in like you have to start with something that was real, right? right? Right. But yet it's still always a metaphor because you can never touch it, right? So it always it's always representative, representative, you know. Yeah. So it's kind of all that kind of like really intrigued me, and I love that. And then it kind of rolled into like there was a little tiny uh, newspaper that was in town, and they would let me hang out, and they would like I shot mostly black and white, so they would develop my film and then I could come and use the dark room when they were busy and that kind of like that friendship and that kind of like assistance really helped nurture all that. And yeah, that was, that was a, I don't really remember what sparked it, but yeah, yeah. it was like, it just kind of pushed me that way. And I, my last medium in my final year at high school was in photography. Mm. I will admit to you right now that if I had dug up those photos, they would not be good. Uh, I mean, again, art is subjective. So you could say they're yeah. not good. We think they're I'm brilliant. Pretty sure, like, <laughs> I'm pretty sure my report card was like, has great potential, but like could <laughs> execute better, right? Like cap great capacity, but needs yeah. to apply it more. Yeah, yeah. I totally um, think there's like, there's totally a technical aspect of almost every art form. Like I think with store like the written story there's the technicalities of grammar and punctuation like with interior design there's technicalities of code and all this others and in and, and measurements and things like that but i just love how like in a sense science and art aren't as different as we make them seem to be in in more ways i feel like they're integrated in in a ways where 100%. yeah yeah where yeah I think, yeah, I nailed, like, oh, yeah, 100%. Like, there's so much I feel like we like to try and say that this isn't uh, these the mutually exclusive, like a lot mm -hmm. of things are, like, it's either this or that, you know, like, we love to try and make things very binary, mm -hmm. when I think even just, like, you look, look at the de definition of the word, like, art, right, or, like, art form, like, you could be, I mean, honestly, you could be an artist if you were... A doctor right like in the way mm. that you carry out your practice that is our pull right that could still be or like the art in a lot of trades is still art right yeah the application of it could be artful or it could be you know more precise and I guess you could say that it would be you know but like yeah no there's like yeah totally, yes totally, for sure totally. now question so do you with, you know, photography being in this digital era, do you still find yourself 
wanting to shoot or do you still shoot with film or have you kind of moved solely into the digital space? No, I, if anything, like uh, shooting more like professionally has actually driven me back to shooting film even mm. more. And I think it's like part of it is like a little bit of like that origin story. Like I had that connection with it when I started and it was that was the only way. Mm -hmm. um, and then kind of like revisiting a lot of things and being sort of like not having the maturity of like it being a part of like my career was more just like kind of part of my life mm -hmm. um, and going back and really having like the knowledge that I have now and then going back and using some of the same gear that mm -hmm. I just took, maybe took for granted like yeah. that's been really wonderful and not also not being able to afford a lot of the stuff that I dreamt about you know back then and now it's like well, I mean, we went through a period where like it was practically being given away and now film has come back in a big way. Yeah. And that's also helped me stay with it um, because it's nice to see that, that there's a huge community around still shooting film. But it, yeah, it's different. Like you don't, like people talk about how you have to slow down a little bit and it's true, but I think it's just like, for me, there's less editing to do because usually like I pick, the film stock, I put it in the camera, I try and expose it properly. Mm. You know, I get the, you know, I scan it, I print it, whatever I do, usually it's like done enough, right? Versus <laughs> like, you only have so many ways that you can kind of take it yeah. after that, because the film really dictates like the look, right? right? Versus like you have a digital image and like the world is your oyster, you know, you could spend like three three years in Photoshop if you wanted, right? Yeah. Making like a hundred different photos, right? So, yeah. and it's almost overwhelming that you have that choice. And I like that on my day off, like it, there is something like to the depth and the intangibility of like looking at a, a photo that is film. But the argument is that you can also take a digital file and I've been fooled and it can look like film, mm. you know? So is, you know, but it does for me because I know that I took it, it's on film, I have the film, you know, like right. I can see the difference, like that's all special for me. So a lot of like our family photos are on film, like some of my favorite shots of our family, like on vacation are, I'm usually got like at least one film camera with me. Yeah. All those, but yeah, it's just a little bit more special because I only had like, you know, like 36 chances to be able to get that day at the beach, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So let's segue into how photography landed you on movie sets. Can you talk about that journey and what that that was like? Yeah, huge detour, frankly. <laughs> um, massive detour. Because like, it's like a, now coming now, it's like in first full circle. But like when I was in high school, and even before I graduated, I loved that, you know, it was like really into like the tech, the, the, theory behind photography and really mm. trying to educate myself better, you know, in terms of like, you know, exposure and, you know, the technicality of what lenses and the properties of each style and like, you know, how different class and, you know, sharp isn't always better and et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then I thought that adding the element of time, which is what film is to, but it's still photography. Mm was like an extra really like wonderful element and that you can only, yeah, like you say a lot in one image, but with motion and time, like you really are saying a whole lot more. And I think it was really about trying to do more with the storytelling aspect. Wow. You know? Yeah, so, and really adding that extra dimension, that like fourth dimension, you know, of having time to really kind of like elaborate on like each, each image and again, not to date myself, we only shot on film. So it was like, really kind of like, <laughs> you know, like, I was like, yeah, like I'm gonna go and like, you know, really get into like, uh, like, you know, motion picture, like film cameras. And like, I really started to nerd out about that and just kind of like learning the process a little bit better. And uh, so I left high school with the intention of going into university for film studies. Oh, wow. Yeah, and, uh, and at one point, I think the dream was, that I was eventually going to become a cinematographer. That's what I really wanted to do. And so, uh, but I was like, I don't know a lot about set lighting um, mm. at that time. So I was like, oh, what I'll do is I'll go and start working in like the lighting department. Um, and so I started 
that part of my like into the industry through lighting sort of I like to say got tricked into gripping which is another department and then kind of actually like sort of settled in and just started that sort of took over and in the background it's really easy to kind of just get sidetracked in the industry if you're not careful about staying on task right Mm -hmm. because it's like it's so many hours on set and it's such a big lifestyle that you just don't have time to like have two jobs which is what like you you work and you're learning but then you're also you should be shooting if you want to shoot yeah as well so when you do that right yeah um yeah, so I got a little sidetracked and then uh, just enjoyed actually being in the grip department and I kind of like bounced around a little bit and I stayed there for quite some time and then um, life, life just took <laughs> over. I got, got married and had yeah. our first child and then it becomes harder and harder to justify being able to be like, um, what's the word I need? Like ambitious, right? Like mm-hmm. it's hard to, yeah. when you have other responsibilities, like, so, and that's really, I lost that part of like the ease of responsibility of my youth to be able to yeah. make, take those chances. So yeah, yeah but uh, long kind of like career in the industry and I'm closer to 20 years than I am 15 and, <laughs> and a lot of different, a lot of different like areas and jobs. And I still am in the grip department um as well here but uh yeah I just kind of came back to photography again so you know working with one photographer on set and I just remember being like I, I, know, I know how to take pictures and you right. take pictures. I, I'm like I'm here helping you and I'm like I feel like I could do this and she's like yeah you could do this yeah and then that's kind of how it started and so how did you find your way into the homework universe how did that happen Honestly, like the first, uh, that Bettina Strauss, she's been like literally a wonderful friend and, and mentor. And she gave me like, like one email address, uh, a publicist at Hallmark. And that was like my first contact trying to wade into like, you know, set photography and, uh, Maria and she's still there and she's amazing. Oh, and, wow. Uh, and she was actually the publicist on this movie, so. Oh, cool! Yeah, um, and uh, that we're going to talk about. But yeah, so she gave me one email, and I remember writing and being like super nervous. And then that was it. That was like that's what, and that's in the as I look back, that was what stuck. Was like I tried to branch out and really kind of like get into a lot of other like production companies and all that stuff. But what really stuck was actually working with Hallmark. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So let's get into that movie. The movie that you're talking about is called Color My World with Color the World with Love. And um, it stars Lily D. Moore, David DeSanctis, Benjamin Ayers, and Erica Durrance. And um, by the time that this comes out, it would have already aired. Um, but it's a beautiful movie with a beautiful premise, uh, which features two actors with Down syndrome. And it's so serendipitous um, that you you are the set photographer for this because, and I'll let you tell it. Talk about the serendipity of just being on this film. I like, I can't, it's, it like, it was really, it was ridiculous. Maria's like really good. <laughs> she'll, she'll like, she's wonderful because she kind of like fronts a lot of information whenever she kind of checks for availability, which I really love because you already know kind of, before you've even been confirmed what the job is going to be like or what the story Mm. is Mm -hmm. so she actually sent me the she was already kind of being like sort of doing a little bit more to kind of sell how special it was and uh and so she sent me an email with the script and the crew list already attached to it so that I could read it and kind of like going a little extra mile kind of saying this one's like pretty special you know we Mm. sort of like we haven't really been here before right we really want to like she was, I think she was trying to set the tone, not knowing anything about like, you know, like we hadn't bridged, we've had lovely conversations, but I don't think we've gotten that deep, like personally yet. Right. And I just remember like sitting in my chair in my office and just like look, reading the email and just being like totally taken aback. Like I couldn't believe how wonderful this was, like it was such a great opportunity and like out of 
you know, like I managed to land it, right? You know, yeah. like I managed to get the call as well. Like it could have been anywhere in time, anywhere in the universe. It could have not even been in Vancouver. Right. It could, you know, so like all that could have been another photographer here. You know, yeah. so it was just really wonderful that that was. I literally wrote her back. Like I think I began the email like, get out. You know? <laughs> <laughs> She's like, are you available? I'm like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> The wonderful story to you know like totally selling it I was just like get out <laughs> very professional email <laughs> and I, I think I followed I was like you'll like guess who has a son with down syndrome and then I think like, mm. I could actually feel her like melt on the other side mm, man. Yeah, she, wrote, she wrote me back like almost immediately and was wow. like, and like I have I have shivers. This is amazing. This yeah. Is, what are the chances? I was like, I can't even, you know, mysterious ways. That's all I can say. So man. Yeah. Have you had a chance to see the movie? I have no, no, okay. not yet. So you're gonna watch it. Are you gonna watch it um, when it airs on that? Yeah, on things Sunday? are a little things are a little different up here because of like you know uh it's, yeah like what what does it air on and do you have access to hallmark channel here which like our house does not but yeah. uh but almost everything always like there might be a little bit of a delay and it airs on something else but i'm pretty sure it's gonna air on a local channel up here so that we'll be able to catch it so it's just a matter when right um but for sure yes yeah yeah but i mean as much as like viewing it and the story and the script and everything is really important like for me it, re it was really being like the reality of being on set and seeing this opportunity unfold in front of me like I not I care about what the script and the story is obviously sure. and how it represents but like how people represented themselves and how like the atmosphere on set was that that was that's what really that's what it was like, what I really wanted to be a part of, you know, what I really wanted to see. Can you talk about that more, this, just the vibe on set and the atmosphere and what it was like as you were shooting on set? Really amazing. Like, I, like, I don't know, there's not a lot of people who really, I think, see, like, know what's behind the curtain, you know, in terms of making a film. And it is kind of like, it's not, it's not always very glamorous as I'm sure it is said. Um, and it is kind of like, <laughs> we like to, I like to make the Wizard of Oz kind of reference. You know, <laughs> yeah. It's like, you pull, it's just like a guy and it's like, you know, this big, and like, it's a huge show and it's like right. kind of sad old man back there, right? And so not every day is like, sometimes you just, you know, you're just like, it's the mechanics of having to push forward and like, you're always in a rush and we're always behind and there's so much to do. And, um, and so it's, it's difficult to so try to see if that would take a back seat or not mm. and roll rolling in like on my day one it was like totally different I was like if every set could be like this mm. it would be so much easier like like immensely more consideration immensely mm. like so much more um just like you could see that there was a lot more energy needing needed from certain people on the crew to really and and our director to really kind of like you know coach and steer you know the days and and whatnot but like the tone yeah. was just be it was really beautiful it just like so much consideration so much like prep in the thought of how to approach you know like the mechanic and how to adjust um what can be like not always like a very humane process you know yeah. like because we're just like you're just going but like you know like the day has to get done but we can still be really wonderful and be inviting and accommodate you know everybody who has completely different needs on set right yeah so, and sure. that space was made and that was like that was everything to me like absolutely mm. everything to me you know like I was done like, <laughs> <laughs> so you had a chance to look at the script though you said uh right did you say yes you yes yeah so, i did yeah in reading the script did you find yourself relating to either the characters of nick or oh and i forget um erica durance's character's name but um emma emma 
Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Nick and Emma, did you find um, spaces or did you find elements of Nick and Emma's story that you can relate to? And then I'll ask you on the back end about um, Brad and then Lily D. Moore's character. Sure, yeah, uh, definitely. There's like, without giving too much away about the story, mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's a bit where uh, Erica's character, Emma's talking with her character's mother and they're mm -hmm. sort of having, uh, telling a story and the grandmother, Bev, is, is pulling out an, a story from the past and it literally like, just word for word almost is exactly what and she's talking about how you know you know they lost her at a swimming pool and mm. she kind of escaped and they looked everywhere for her and all this and then ended up yeah. that she was coming out of the men's washroom and so our son miles like not m like definitely more than once have we been like oh man where did you go like literally mm. just turned around for like a split second and you're just like you know I don't, I don't know, like, and you're running around everywhere and you're trying to figure him out. And literally he locked himself in the women's washroom. Mm. Like, and that's like more than one occasion that's happened. And you're like, you have, you laugh a little bit at once you get there, but sure. yeah. So, but it, it's, it's, yeah, that resonated. I mean, that, that literally has happened to us like exactly almost in the same situation more than once. So I was like, that's a real story. <laughs> Yeah. That's a real, that, that is like, that is legit. That checks out for us. You know, flight risk is totally a thing. So yeah. Yeah. And he's, he's just trying to go and he's just living his life. So yeah. just like she just needed to go to the bathroom. Right. She didn't, right. She didn't even know <laughs> that it needed to be the men's or the women's washer. Right. Right. Now yeah. with um, Lily D. Moore's character, Kendall, I believe. And then um, David DeSanctis character, Brad. Has there, did you see within their characters anything that you could resonate with that you've dealt with, maybe that you've heard from your son, Miles, or um, anything in what they voiced as Kendall and Brad? Could you relate to anything that they've said um, in their characters? Yeah, I think just like you hear a lot in the story about how, I think mo mostly Emma Nick is... I think Nick is somebody that I, like Brad's character, I just admire his character because that's mm. something that, you know, like I, I really, I, I lived as a parent through Emma in the story because mm -hmm. like I had the same appreciation for what Nick is trying to do, right? Mm. In the story with mm -hmm. where he's trying to, how he's trying to like build that inclusivity in community. And it re that part really resonated with me because it really, I really love this idea that we need that kind of diversity in community. Yeah. Like you really can't have that segregation of like, well, the well-to-do people live here and the people who have, who have like need extra resources are over here getting those resources. But like, right. you know, that in like integration really does enrich everybody. Yeah. Um, and that's something that we do get at our son's school. Like he's integrated with like, his brother, you know, who's in a yeah. like, higher grade, he's, he's with other kids, you know, like he just is. And then he just gets extra support, but he's in that environment, not taken out and, you know, being schooled separately, you right. know, in a completely segregated environment. Right. So, but really I live, I live through Emma and just like that, you just have our son seven, you know, Kendall is in the story she's older mm -hmm. so we're not there yet so I think a little bit of it is like you know Emma talks about like kind of thinking back and reflecting on her best wishes and hopes and fears about the life that she's trying to build for yeah. Kendall and just like really being worried about that and those are all the same feelings that we have you know like you just mm -hmm. want they're your kids and right. you just want you want the best for them right except right. for you know, the world's not going to give them as many favors as, you know, other kids would have. So, yeah. and they're not going to be able to have necessarily the same access to abilities or resources that they need. So depending on where you are, but you just want I, them to yeah. thrive, right? Right. Like a, like a human being, because that's what they are. Like, it's just, yeah, the, man. And, um, 
there was a scene where there were two at different points in the movie there were two women who had some not nice things to say about um concerning Kendall one when she was painting and another when she was trying on I won't spoil it she was trying on a piece of clothing (laughs) but um and I, I appreciated that Hallmark Movies and Mysteries went there too, to show that there are people out there, unfortunately, who have that viewpoint concerning, like when they see someone with Down syndrome, just the, what's the word I'm looking for? Prejudice, stere- like just the stereotype that they, that they come with, they think one thing yeah. and I- mean, real, real- yeah. yeah, really. It's just like, you just don't know what you don't know. Right. right. That's it. And then not, and I don't mean to just like, I, we like to use ignorance as like a really dark and negative, usually carries a lot of negative connotation, but like ignorance is just, some, it's just, it's you just what you don't know. Truly. Right? So, Truly. And really that's what carries, I think a lot of, it, you know, from an empathetic perspective, mm-hmm. like it's hard to fault a lot of people because if you, it's not in your life and you don't know, and you just don't know, right? You need that mm-hmm. education. Yeah. 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 So yeah, from those, it's tough. I'm really happy that they did touch on that because that is the reality. And there's a duality, I think, you know, as a, you know, from the parent side, it's exhausting because you're constantly mm-hmm. educating as well as you're advocating, sure. you know, and then we're lucky. Generally speaking, we have a very, like, you know, there's a lot of tolerance and like acceptance, I think, in the broader community where we live. So that Mm -hmm. does help. Like he goes to a really progressive school that is a public school as well. It's not even a private school. And everybody knows his name, right? So he gets a lot of like, in his his own way, he's like, our son's a celebrity. Like my wife just literally told me a story while I was at work. And she said that they were at a cafe and all the kids were walking home from like a, a... walk to one of the local parks and and they passed them and they weren't at school because he was at an appointment and they all saw him sitting in the cafe with my wife and every single one of them said hi miles as oh man like they all knew him so that's like it's a great we we're lucky that way but yeah there still is like you just don't like people sometimes and then there's overcompensation too like where people are just like oh he's special like uh, well, right. You know, yeah. So there's a whole rainbow of just, you know, going too far, not knowing, not what doing do. enough, not <laughs> right. doing anything, what to say. People, right. not, people overcompensating, people undercompensating, people just not doing it. People, and every once in a while, you do run into people who are just like they do carry that. Like you know, they're not, not real people sometimes because mm-hmm. you know. But again, I think it just comes back to you just don't know what you don't know, right? You give. Yeah. Anybody that has worked with kids or adults with special needs who has seen our son literally has been like immediately, like not only accepting, but like, like I have so many stories of them just like immediately being on our side and advocating just in like a public space as well. Just being like, oh, you got to come like, okay, here, you need all these things. I totally, and you know, they get it. And that comes from just like, they know because mm-hmm. they were there they've been integrated they know yeah. and that again comes back to what i think is really wonderful about what nick's character is doing is that that's that enrichment right yeah that integration is that enrichment that really enriches us all like you know the broader community gets to be exposed to something that is natural and then all these people who have extra needs get exposed to a community that can then support them right yeah yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Alistair, thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. Um, before I let you go, go, I just wanted to give you the floor if you want to talk about, um, if you want to say anything, mention why people should watch, if they haven't already watched Color My World with Love, or I'm going to just let you leave it, leave, like have the last word and whatever you like the viewers and the listeners to leave with? Uh, I am really proud of this title. This is like, I think on a personal level, obviously like the experience of making it was the most important, but 
it's hard to encapsulate like this kind of story and make it representative of everybody who has you know a child with a designation um because that in itself is like such a spectrum so mm -hmm. like the, your the experiences won't always like so it, and i had to kind of talk about this with with uh maria you know about how it isn't necessarily a movie for people who have kids with special designations but i think it's wonderful that there's a movie that tries to represent and i think it really is for everybody else yeah you know to be able to see that and i love that hallmark has been really taking um, more and more of those chances you know so it's really just such a blessing to be able to be a part of that and to really kind of like usher in even more visibility you know and it is it's a great story it still i think really holds true to what the brand tries to do mm -hmm. you know which is really have like a wonderful heartwarming story that still kind of pulls at you a little bit and i feel like it takes a little bit more chances like this one actually pulls a few more heartstrings than i think most other movies do which is yeah. really also uncharacteristic you know yeah. there are actually a few more stakes you know which yeah. is really wonderful but yet it does i think it actually does a really great job and so it's, it's a great beginning of hopefully what is like a, a, a long chapter of visibility and representation Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much for coming into the home of Dear Hallmark. It was a pleasure talking with you, sir. It was um, so wonderful to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And you guys, uh, if you want to know more about Alistair, I'm going to link his website in the show notes. And if you're listening via podcast and in the description, if you're watching via YouTube. But you guys, he's Alistair. I'm Dara. This is Dear Hallmark. And I will talk to you guys in the next episode. Hey, thank you so much.